All right, guys. Let's go over this. Okay, so we're making a secondary alcohol. The maiden question that you want to ask yourself is, how do you make a secondary alcohol? What are the functional groups? What are the reagents that have to react in order to do that? Yeah. What's that? Oh, so just in general, right? Think of thinking about just functional groups. How would we? What would we have to combine? So in, in your reaction, what functional group, carbonyl functional group are you starting with? I started with a carbonyl acid. Oh, no, I, I started with an aldehyde. Good, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then I started with And you're adding what to it? What type of reagent? Starts with a G. Oh, Grignard. Good, right? Good, Grignard reagent. Okay, so we can make a secondary alcohol if we take an aldehyde and we add a carbon nucleophile through a Grignard reagent. So that's one method for making secondary alcohols. It's another way to approach secondary alcohols, yeah. Okay, so the other way is that we can take a ketone. And what are we adding? Good, right, plus a hydride nucleophile. Okay, that could be sodium borohydride, could be lithium aluminum hydride, right? There are other really cool hydride reagents we didn't go over, right? But they're all delivering an H minus. And so when we look at this starting material, this, this product that we want to make, and think about what pieces we need to make it, well, we can take a, an aldehyde, right? An aldehyde that has this hydrogen and this um, aryl group on it, right? And we can add that piece, we can add the owl group to a green reagent. Okay? If we wanted to, we can also take an aldehyde where we have the hydrogen and the owl group on it, right? And we add this piece, the phenyl group. Okay? And then the third way to make this would be to have a ketone where we have the owl group and the aryl group, and we're adding a hydride, right? So this is going to be the third disconnection. Now, So uh, this is the method I think Gianna was, was suggesting, yeah, right? So we're taking an aldehyde, right? Our aldehyde, see in the product, we have a hydrogen and this uh, uh, three methoxy aryl group, right? So on our aldehyde, we have a hydrogen and a three methoxy aryl group, and we're just need, needing to make a nucleophilic connection to the carbonyl carbon, right? So this is our nucleophile, that's the third piece we want to add. Right, our three carbon aldehyde group. It's going to add to the carbonyl, and then we quench the reaction, protonate the oxygen with the acidic workup. Will um, this reaction always have THF in it? THF is the solvent, so, so we can matter. use. I mean, it matters what the solvent is, right? We went over the other day how we can't use alcoholic solvents, protic solvents, with, with Grignards. But Grignards typically use ethereal solvents, so diethyl ether, THF, um, dioxane is another one that's commonly used. But it's not, THF is not exclusive to Grignard's. Other questions? Okay, so the other option for the aldehyde would be to add, rather than adding the aldehyde group, to add this piece here. Right, so we would start with right, the carbonyl that has the hydrogen and the aldehyde group on it. And then we 
just invent a Grignard that would allow us to add the other piece. Once the addition occurs, we need to quench and protonate the oxygen. So we add just an acidic aqueous marker. Right, any questions on these two? Everybody see how, how we're connecting the nucleophile to the electrophile to make the product? Okay, so the third way, <clears throat> rather than starting with aldehydes, would be to take a ketone and deliver a hydride nucleophile to the carbonyl, right? So in this case, because we're using a ketone, we can just use sodium borohydride and some alcoholic solvent, we'll say ethanol. <clears throat> And that's also going to allow us to make the product. Questions about this? So this is pretty cool, right? Because we have one product that we need to make, you have three different ways of, of approaching the synthesis of this thing. Right? So say you go into the lab and you want to make that product. We don't have this, we don't have this, but we happen to have that aldehyde. Right? And you can make our granular reagent so you're good to go. Right? It's nice to have options. Questions? So just uh, one or two more things to talk about regarding granular reagents. Okay, so here's a reaction. I'm showing you the reagents. I'm showing you the product that's formed in this reaction. What I want you to do is tell me what the starting material is. What is that Grignard reagent reacting with to make it? <coughs> you have two minutes to copy this down and take a look at it. Talk to your neighbors.
All right, so what reagent would we write to the left of the arrow? Yeah. Carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acid. Making carboxylic acid. What's that? Not an ester. So, so I wrote a question up here on the board, right? What's the atomic difference between the Grignard, right, the reagent, and the product? What atoms are, are missing? Carbon dioxide, right? So we have one carbon, two oxygens, and then we have this proton here, all right? The proton, the hydrogen, comes from the acidic workup, and so all we're doing is adding one carbon and two oxygens, right? So that's gonna come in the form of carbon dioxide, Right. The Grignard is going to add to the carbon dioxide like it would any other carbonyl. Break one of the two carbon oxygen pi bonds. Okay, and then this carbon carbon bond between the carbonyl carbon and the phenyl group. That's the bond that was made in the reaction. All right, and then to get to the product, all we're doing is protonating with the aqueous quench. All right, so this is kind of a, a unique reaction, right? We haven't learned too many ways to make um, carboxylic acids from non-carboxylic acid derivatives. This is a, a, a great reaction where we can stitch together, you know, make carbon-carbon bonds uh, and stitch together a carboxylic acid through the addition of Grignard to carbon dioxide. <coughs> Questions about this? Um, so the last thing that I'll, I'll just remark on Grignard reagents, so these are just kind of some lingering details that... <coughs> Um, it's something that Rachel asked about earlier, and that's the nature of the solvent. So uh, we typically use ethereal solvents, so these are things like THF, Solvents, uh, small molecules, small molecule solvents that have ethereal groups in them. All right, obviously you want to avoid things like carbonyl solvents. Right, so acetone, ethyl acetate, we can't use with Grignard chemistry because the Grignards will add to those the carbonyls and those solvents, right? So they'll react, the solvents will react with reagents, right? And we also want to avoid protosolvents. solvents. Right, things like alcohols, water, carboxylic acids, Right? Because the Grignard reagents will just deprotonate those, those solvents um, and will destroy the Grignard reagent. Okay, so we want to make sure that the solvent we're using is inert, it's not reacting with the Grignard reagent. Um, and then that uh, typically the ethereal solvents help out. Um, so if we imagine a Grignard reagent, looking at Grignard reagents with bromines, Grignard reagents can also be made with uh, chlorines as well, right? So if we start with the, the chlorobenzene and add magnesium, it'll just insert itself between chlorine and carbon, right? Reagent works the same way, so don't get tripped up on that, on that difference. 
right? What we see, or the, the role that we see ethereal solvents playing is that they help to stabilize and solubilize the Grignard reagent. So the fact that this has magnesium in it, the fact that we have really polar bonds, makes this less soluble uh, in organic media, right? But because um, this magnesium has a significant partial positive charge, oxygens of ethereal solvents have partial negative charges, we can get this coordination between the oxygens of the ethereal solvent and the magnesium of the Grignard reagents. Right? This is going to basically, we're surrounding um, the Grignard reagent with these solvent molecules and helping them dissolve into solution a little better, right? stabilizing them. Right, so if we were to try to run these reactions in hexanes, straight chain hydrocarbon, they wouldn't really work as well because they don't have, they can't contribute the same effect, the same stabilizing effect. Right, so the solvent, even though we don't show it mechanistically, it does play a role in these reactions. Right, it makes molecules comfortable, it makes them uncomfortable, depending upon what the intermolecular interactions are. Questions about this? So chapter 11 deals with stereochemistry and chirality. This, this is a topic that you've been exposed to before, so everybody got a, a little taste of, of this um, in ICP. Um, we're going to go over it at greater depth. Um, if I go a little too fast, because I'm assuming you understand something already, just let me know, and you can backtrack and go over it again. <coughs> right, so I'm going to uh, write out a, re a simple reaction. Methyl ketone, and we're treating this with sodium borohydride. Imagine this mechanistically, right? We know that the borohydride nucleophile adds to carbonyl carbon nucleophile, right? And we break a carbon oxygen ion, so that a nucleophile is being delivered to the carbonyl, right? In terms of the orbitals involved in this step of the reaction. All right, where's the homo and lumo? Yes, yeah, so that's what the acronym stands for, but what are the actual orbitals, yeah. So in order for these uh, two molecules to react with one another, right, the sigma bonding orbital between boron and hydrogen, right, so this little balloon here with two electrons in it, that's got to overlap with the pi star orbital on the carbonyl. Right, the anti-bonding orbital of the carbonyl. So 
what that looks like sigma bond between the carbon and the oxygen. We have our pi bond between the carbon and the oxygen. Okay. And then pi star orbital kind of looks like the original p orbitals that had to overlap to form the pi bond. So that's the pi antibody orbital. So whenever, whenever this nucleophile adds, right, that nucleophile has a choice of adding from two faces. Okay, it always has to approach from the direction that the pi star orbital is coming out, right? But there are two options that it has, right? So that nucleophile can add from the top face, right? Or that nucleophile can add from the bottom face. All right? And the addition to those two different faces is going to give us two different isomers. Right? So we can get an isomer where we have the hydroxyl group going towards the back of the border, and the hydrogen coming out of the border. Right? You can also imagine that if the hydride is added to the opposite face, we would create another molecule another isomer of this molecule, where the hydroxyl group is coming out, and the hydrogen is going back. Okay, everybody agree with this? Everybody understand? You can see how these two products would evolve? Yeah? Okay, so these two products that we've made, they're related to one another as stereoisomers. And specifically, we, their relationship is as enantiomers. All right, how many people have heard that term before, enantiomer? So, um, what are enantiomers? How do we define that term? Anybody know? Yep, yep, almost. So, molecules that are related as non superimposable. non-superimposable is kind of a, a, a key part of the definition. Right, and the enantiomers that we're going to be looking at all have um, the property of being uh, tetrahedral, having tetrahedral chirality. Tetrahedral chirality is, is uh, uh, chirality, we'll, we'll talk about that in greater depth, but a uh, tetrahedral chiral center is a tetrahedral center with four different substituents coming off of it. Right? 
right? They don't have to be super different, right? One substituent could have a, a 13 carbon chain, the other substituent could have a 14 carbon chain, right? That would be enough difference. You could have two substituents that have a 13 carbon chain, and one of them has a deuterium in the place of one hydrogen. They would be different. Right? So it doesn't have to be one's an oxygen, one's a chlorine, one's a benzene ring, one's a methyl group. Right? Any small difference is enough to make a, a, a center chiral. Okay, so let me give you an example. Um, I think everybody's probably heard this example before. So your hands, right? The hands are, are chiral. Okay, there's a, hopefully everybody in this class has a top side of their hand that's different from the bottom side. Right? And then the left side of one hand is going to be different from the right side of that hand, right? So my thumb is on my left, my pinky's on my right, so my right hand. Okay? Your other hand looks the same, right? Mirror images, so you can imagine if there's a mirror right here, right? My hands would look the same. I can turn them this way, they're mirror images of each other. Turn them this way, they're mirror images of each other. But I try to superimpose them over one another and make the match. That can't happen. Right? In this case, my thumb, one thumb is off one side, the other thumb is off the other side. Right? Here the thumbs are aligned, but you know, top of one hand is going one way, top of the other hand is going the other way. Okay? So these are, are chiral entities. Um, the word chirality actually is derived from the word, uh, the Greek word for hand, which is chiral. Okay? So when we have tetrahedral chirality in molecules, right? So these are just tetrahedral centers. I'm not specifying what the substituents are. I've just put four different colored bonds here, right? So we have blue, red, yellow, and black, right? So you both have a blue, red, yellow, and black center. I can align these so that they're mirror images of each other, right, in any direction. Okay, but if I try to superimpose them over one another, right, you can see that I can always line up two bonds, right? So the yellow and black are lined up, but the red and blue are mixed up. So if I try to turn that around, well, if I do that, well, yeah, I can't, yeah. So I got two matched up here, and now the red and black are, are mixed up, right? So these would be chiral centers. They look the same, right? We would draw them more or less the same way, except for the a difference in, in wedges or dashes, but they're not the same molecule. All right, so chiral compounds, Chiral compounds are going to have this property called optical activity, right? Um, and all that means is that they're going to interact with and rotate plain polarized light. So what does that mean? What's, what's um, plain polarized light? How many people have polarized sunglasses? Okay, how do they work? Just put them on. They work. Um, okay, so plain polarized light. So, so light it comes in waves, right? These waves, when they wave at you, they can wave at you in an infinite number of directions or an infinite number of angles, right? So those waves come this way, those waves can come this way, come diagonally, okay? Um, polarized sunglasses uh, have slits in them that are vertical. And what that does it, it, is it excludes any light that is not waving at you vertically. Right? So the only light that can get to your eyes when you're wearing polarized sunglasses is light that's going generally up and down. Right? Maybe a little bit angled, but generally just up and down. Okay? Um, whenever light reflects off of surfaces. So, so polarized glasses became pretty popular among fishermen. <coughs> Um, because light that reflects off of surfaces, you, you wear, have you worn them, Joey, for, for fishing? Yeah. So you can see it in the water when you look at the water. 
see in the water really well, right? So the, the light that's reflected off of water, off of horizontal surfaces, is polarized horizontally. So when that light hits those glasses, it's not gonna be able to get through those glasses. So the reason why you can see the water really well is because you don't really see the reflections coming off of the water, all right? If you're, if you're driving a car on a sunny day and uh, you're not wearing glasses, you see a pretty good reflection off of the dashboard, you put polarized sunglasses on, that reflection is, uh, is uh, dissipates really significantly. Okay. So chiral molecules, they interact with plain polarized light. So we can take light and we can filter out all of the other waves except the one that goes vertically or you know, which, whichever direction we, we want to, to filter out. So if we take polarized light, right, light that's waving in one direction, and we shine it through a sample of a chiral molecule, when it comes out the other side of the sample, it's going to be rotated, right? And the amount that it rotates depends upon the concentration of the sample, the type of molecule it's, it's, it's interacting with, but it's going to be rotated one way or the other, right? And that's a, a property of chiral molecules. They can take that light that's, that's waving in one direction and alter it, Right, so it's, it starts to wave in another direction once it passes through. Okay, so that's the property of optical activity. Um, in terms of enantiomers, right, so if we just take a look at the simple enantiomer. Uh, right, so these two molecules Right? They would have the same exact melting point, same exact boiling point. If we were to take an NMR of these two molecules, we would see the exact same NMR spectrum. Um, if we took a mass spec of these two molecules, they would have the exact same mass spectrum. Same IR spectrum. Same. Okay, so same physical properties. Okay, the only differences between these is that one is going to rotate plain polarized light in one direction, all right? The other is going to rotate plain polarized light to the same degree, but in the opposite direction, all right? So this will say rotate like clockwise, right? I don't, I'm not, I'm making this up. This is just for, for um, example purposes, right? And the opposite antimer will rotate like counterclockwise. Right? It's even better than that. It's not just one rotates light clockwise, one rotates light counterclockwise. They rotate light to the same degree, right? So say this rotates light 17.1 degrees clockwise. This is going to rotate light 17.1 degrees counterclockwise. Right? So they're going to have the same effect on that light, but just in opposite directions. Okay. The other difference in how these molecules are, are going to behave is how they interact with other chiral compounds. So a good example of this, our bodies, uh, most biological uh, entities are composed of, of chiral building blocks. Okay, so DNA um, is in a helix and that helix spins in one direction, right? It's right-handed, it's a right-handed helix. A left-handed helix would be the opposite um, enantiomer of the right-handed helix, okay? But DNA is only a right-handed helix. Uh, our proteins are composed of amino acids, right? And amino acids
have a chiral center. Most all, well, almost all the naturally occurring amino acids have a chiral center in them, right? So proteins which are composed of long chains of amino acids are gonna have a bunch of chiral molecules. Those proteins themselves, when they fold, they're going to fold in a chiral, a chiral fashion, right? So you can imagine if I'm a drug, all right, and I have two enantiomers, okay, and one enantiomer um, cures your disease, right, and the other enantiomer uh, makes you really ticklish, say, it does something stupid, okay? And uh, Rachel over here is, is the, the protein that these molecules have to interact with, all right? She is, because she was composed of amino acids that are naturally occurring, she's only going to be one enantiomer. That protein is, is a single enantiomer. So if I'm a drug molecule and I come over and try to, to interact with the single enantiomer here, right, this drug molecule interacts really well, right, can bind to that protein well, form a good bond, right? This other drug, drug molecule that makes you laugh really hard, right, it's not gonna be able to bind to that protein very well, right? It could, it could touch the protein, but it's not gonna have that strong handshake. And so that's a consequence of having, you know, chiral uh, enantiomers interact with a, 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 another chiral molecule, right? Those enantiomers are not going to interact on the same way. So that's gonna be the only differences between those enantiomers, just how they interact with plain polarized light and how they interact with other chiral compounds, right? And we'll look at some specific examples of this on Yeah, they'll interact the same way with my. Do we need to have seen what they're doing?